Hello friends, and welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast. We need a paradigm shift if it comes to our economic and social systems. Let us drive this change together. The Just Another Mindset podcast shares inspiration and tangible techniques on how to create seismic shifts in an outdated system, collectively and for individuals alike. My name is Ismail, and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or theme that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life. Get encouraged by listening to successful thought leaders, inspiring individuals and impressive change makers. Change from within will last and create positive results for all of us. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. In this episode, we talk about the power of taking a break and re-evaluating in regard to your career. Charlotte fell in love with Indonesia and you will learn why. She shares with us why waste management is such an important topic and why she decided to create a tech startup called No Limba that focuses on waste collection and proper management. You will learn about the challenges of waste management on a global and on a local scale. You will further learn what you can do in order to produce less waste and what impact proper waste management has on the environment. We discuss the value of waste and you will hear about the important role of education. And with that, Charlotte, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you today is, how do you feel and what is on your mind? Thank you, Ismail. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on the podcast. Um, as uh, I told you the other day, it's uh, kind of a new exercise, so it's uh, it's very nice being here today. Uh, I'm doing great. And what is on my mind? Just excitement to talk a bit more about what I do and about everything here, hopefully share some knowledge. And yeah, that's about it. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. And yeah, I'm also likewise looking forward to our conversation and I am excited for that. And Charlotte, today you are the CEO of No Limber, which is a refined waste management tech startup that encourages households to dispose of their waste responsibility in the most effective and effortless way. But before we talk about No Limber in greater detail, which we definitely will do today, I would like to give a little bit of a context also for our audience. And maybe you can talk us through some important steps throughout your academic or also your professional career before No Limba and before Bali. And I suppose this is how I want to open up the stage. Sure thing. Um, well, it's interesting because I'm going to obviously tell some details about uh, my academics, my experience, but it probably led to what I'm doing now, but it doesn't seem so connected. So um, that's actually quite interesting. Um, but yeah, basically my initial background was in the energy industry. Um, so I started, you know, my early uh, years working, I started working in oil and gas companies. Um, I was actually working more in the energy transition department of these companies. A lot of interesting things um, came out of this, but it's always a bit surprising when I mentioned that to people because I ended up, you know, kind of switching to um, more hardcore sustainability and starting initially in oil and gas companies. Um, so that was the very, very early years doing some business uh, consulting. Basically, I was a business analyst um, in these companies and it didn't really fit. It wasn't really suitable for me. Let's put it that way. Um, for many, many reasons, but I didn't feel quite like I belonged um, to the corporate world, <laughs> let's put it this way. Um, so I decided to just have a break initially. It started with a break. Let's pause it for a bit. Let's maybe take some months or a year away um, and see you know, other places, meet other types of people and see if I'm happy to go back to this or see what happens. 
And so that's how it started, decided to travel a bit. Um, I went to Australia for a couple of years, um, then went to New Zealand for a year. And obviously it changed my perspective quite a bit. Uh, I met very different people, um, a lot of different people, did some completely different jobs, which I don't know if I would be happy to go back to, but it just opened my mind to different things, you know, doing some farming, hospitality, um, things that were more on site um, and just experiencing life a bit more. Um, and it just got me thinking, uh, do, do I want to go back to this or do I want to find something that, you know, I'm a bit more passionate about? Um, don't get me wrong, the energy industry is very interesting. But yeah, probably the more the consulting side, the really office, office life was not very much what I was into. So what can I find that kind of combines a, a topic that I'm interested in, but at the same time, having more this on-site feeling, learning from the ground, um, learning from people, being more interactive, in, interacting with more people, these sort of things. Um, so I just experienced like this over my travels and I went back to Indonesia because I forgot to mention that my first time was about 10 years ago. So before I started traveling, just as a holiday. And I went back to Indonesia um, because it's it was a lovely experience. It was a country I fell in love with quite immediately. Um, so I went back there and realized, yeah, you know, this this waste issue is actually huge. There is definitely something to do about it. What can I do about it? Well, for a start, I would need to be in the country and again, experience in the country, understand what is going on in the country, what are the existing solutions, what is not existing, uh, what could we add up to improve whatever system is here. And that's when I decided to move more permanently to Indonesia and um, yeah, start, um, start experiencing and understanding to work in sustainability in Indonesia. Okay, thank you very much. So as I understand, you understood that you would like to move to Indonesia, and then you found a topic there that you are passionate about. It was not the other way around that you said you have to do waste management, and then you were searching for the country where it's most needed. But it's really this love for Indonesia and Bali that I hear from you. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the very first time that I went there about yeah, 10 years ago, immediately fell in love with it. Didn't think one bit that I would end up moving there, um, but I absolutely fell in love with the country, with the, all of it, the beauty, the culture, the people, pretty much everything. Um, I started diving there. I'm quite passionate about the ocean. So everything, every activity ocean related, I was very much into, um, but didn't think one bit that I would actually permanently move. Um, but notice obviously the waste problem. And when you really love something and notice such a big problem um, that goes with it, it kind of triggers something, right? You're like, how, what can I do to actually help this? But you're absolutely right. It was more, what can I do to help this beautiful country in whatever capacity overcome this issue that I'm seeing than, you know, only the waste management um, issue that came to me straight away. How long ago? How long ago did you permanently move to Indonesia then? So I was meant to before COVID, so in twenty nineteen, um, and then COVID. <laughs> so I think we all know what it means. Um, so yeah, COVID ha COVID happened, and uh, that meant you know, well actually we didn't know what it meant at the time. So that was the problem. A lot of people were saying that you know our families, friends could be in danger. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back to my country, make sure that I would be close to my family and friends. Um, and so I went back to France and kind of got stuck. Um, but I went back as soon as the borders reopened in Indonesia. So in 2021. And when you came back to Indonesia and we talk about waste management, how much of a challenge is the mismanagement of waste in Indonesia? It is huge. <laughs> it is absolutely huge. So I think just to give a little number here, um, Indonesia is just second to China as the world's largest contributor to the um, plastic um, ocean pollution. So it is a, it is definitely a big, big problem, not only for Indonesia, but for the entire planet. Um, it is absolutely huge because in terms of mismanaged waste, there is a huge, huge gap in waste collection here which means that most waste, and literally most waste, more than 50%, 61%, is not collected at all. 
Um, so imagine just generating, like producing your waste on a daily and imagine that more than half of it doesn't get collected at all. That leaves very few um, room for the waste to be properly managed if it's not even collected in the first place, right? So yeah, more than 60% is not collected and 70% or so is mismanaged anyway. So that means an extra 10% gets collected and ends up somehow going back to the environment, going to dump sites or you know being mismanaged in some sort of way. Just for me to understand what different types of waste are there? Because I suppose it's different if you have organic waste, if you have plastic waste, I don't know what other types of waste there are electronic waste um i don't know what comes to mind just to give a brief understanding for our audience what different types of waste there absolutely no, that's a great question so there's a bit of everything the majority is organic waste um which you know is a great point because that that is not a waste for instance that we i'll get into this but that's not a, a waste that the type of waste that we deal with at nolimba and that shows the magnitude of the problem, right? It's like, even if we are focusing on inorganic waste, and even if we sorted it completely, there would still be 60% of what is being generated that is still a big problem. That's organic waste. Um, so that's the majority of the waste. And then you have a lot of plastics. Um, for the funny story, plastic bags um, are meant to be banned here in Bali. And yet that's probably the request that we get the most from households that do tell us like, what can we do with our plastic bags because they're still everywhere um so you have a lot lot of a lot of plastics metals cans tin or even like components of um big um how do you say like a an ac for instance like components from the ac or these sort of things um glass glass bottles a lot of it cardboard so anything paper based um so pretty much a bit of everything but something that's interesting to understand is that especially for plastic packages, we are in a tropical country and anything that is food related, you know, if you leave it a bit too much outside for a bit too long, uh, you're going to have some insects coming. The heat is not going to do good to the food, these sort of things. Um, and the first time I came here, I did not understand why every single little biscuits from a pack would be wrapped in a, another, you know, plastic, um, plastic uh, package. But you understand very quickly when you live here, it's like it, there's not much, op, like many options when it comes to wrapping things to actually keep them um, properly. So yeah, that creates even more, you know, sachets and and, uh, and waste like this. Hmm. Okay, I thank you very much for that. And I actually have a couple of follow-up questions. And the first one, if you say plastic bags, for example, are officially banned, who still uses them? Everyone. <laughs> everyone <laughs> so there is a huge gap between the law and the implementation um if you if you come to bali in the city like uh, where i'm based where a lot of foreigners are based you will see definitely more um respect for the law or like you know more restaurants or businesses that actually ask you to pay a little bit for the plastic bags this sort of things it, it is somehow implemented as soon as you start going more to villages or a bit more remote areas, this is another story. Um, and literally everyone, or almost everyone uses it. It's, uh, I mean, I understand there's a bit of time. It was banned fairly recently in 2018, if I recall it properly. So let's let's say that it takes a bit of time, you know, to implement it fully. I understand that, um, but there's still a long way to go before everyone actually stops using them. And how much does that have to do with education in a way i want to give a little side story when i was supposedly 10 years back or 15 years back on an indian train and i was nicely collecting all my trash let's say in order to throw it away because india also does have a huge waste problem as many people are also aware and there was an old lady coming to the same coach and she took all the trash and threw it out of the window and i was like okay what just happened and she explained to me that well with hands and not so much with words, to be honest, but that waste belongs outside. And I later spoke to co-workers of mine and they told me, yeah, they 
do not get the education. So if you back then had only your organic waste and you collected it all in your banana leaf, then you could just throw it and it would basically be compost and would actually be, be beneficial. I know it's a different story, but how much of education do people in Indonesia actually get around waste management? That's the first question, yeah. Yeah, it's, it has everything to do with it. I know you said it's a different story, but it is, you mentioned the banana leaf. It is exactly the same backstory here, um, where people were actually wrapping everything in banana leaf. Um, sometimes, you know, whatever made with coconuts, like they would have these organic um, items to be able to wrap things. And then plastic was brought here with probably not much education on how to handle it. Um, and I mean, that's probably also because we are not perfectly handling it back home or like in whatever countries brought them to Indonesia. Um, but yeah, the problem was kind of brought a bit too fast, a bit too soon with no proper ways to manage it and handle it properly. And so the habits remained of throwing to the side exactly like the banana leaf, whatever plastic wrap um, that was um, that was used after the banana leaf. And and that stayed for the longest. Now, if you ask to a lot of people, they're starting to have, I'm talking about Bali, because obviously the more remote areas, the less education you get about it. In Bali, even in some villages, you start to have some ideas um, of, you know, how harmful it is to the environment. Now there's still a gap between the knowing it's harmful and actually taking steps towards doing better um, about it. So there's still a long way to go. But you can tell people start to have a bit of an understanding of, of how harmful it can get. Um, and also there's an understanding and that's something we're going to, we're going to get to um, with Nolimba. There's an understanding probably more so than in the West of the value attached to the waste, which motivates people somehow, you know, um, to sort their waste um, probably better than, than some people would do back home if they were not forced to. Um, because they do understand there's actually a value attached to it. So yeah, it's um there's still a there's still some some work to do, but we're slowly but surely getting there, at least in Bali, I'm not talking about you know very remote islands. On a very high level, and you can answer this question on a global level or on an Indonesian level, how would proper waste management look like? Well, Believe it or not, I do think that Indonesia is on to something <laughs> with their system, not the way it is implemented, but I actually do like the um, the local side of it. They do waste management at a local level, so it's not the centralized government that deal with it. It is the head of the village, the head of the community, et cetera, that takes care of it. The way I see it happening, even at a global level, is local solutions that are just interconnected between them. So instead of having those kind of disconnected big system that are just imposed to everyone, it's like, okay, our community is handling it this way. We are very much in touch with the collectors. We're very much in touch with the, um, uh, the head of the Banjar in Indonesia. So the head of uh, the community around here, uh, we can get direct education from them. We can be directly in touch with them and it works really well at our little level. And then this is interconnected to, you know, bigger recycling centers or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's the way I see it. It's very local solutions that are kind of networked together. And I'm sure we're going to talk about your entanglement with local authorities and cleanup services and so forth. But maybe just to give another idea about Indonesia, if waste is not properly managed, you mentioned the ocean. So you said that it's the second biggest polluter behind China. What else does happen with waste? I suppose burning could be a big problem as well. I suppose illegal dumping could be an issue. I don't know if you have anything to share around that. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a, this is exactly it. So burning is actually the main, the main thing that happens with the waste, right? It's like almost almost fifty percent of the generated waste, like forty seven percent, that gets burnt out in the open, and um, that's a massive problem. For many reasons, but um, health, you know, health issues is uh, is probably the biggest issue. Uh, obviously, you have some toxic fumes from burning the waste. We all inhale this, me included. Uh, you have this very distinct smell that you can smell very often just driving on the road sometimes. Um, so yeah, this is all toxic fumes that we um, inhale, you know, and that can cause a lot of diseases. I don't have them all at the top of my head, but heart conditions, 
a lot of uh, very bad things. So that's one of them. Discarding in the environment. So I mentioned the ocean, but it starts before that, obviously. It starts in the river. The villages that we work in, we do see people going. There's like this, this dump sites that somehow is by the river and you have people going and piling up things like those plastic bags full of trash on top of one another until it's a bit too big just falls down the river and it goes straight to the ocean and it keeps going like this and that's normal practice very sadly in a lot lot of places um so yeah that's that's mostly what happens so i usually talk about the ocean because it's my personal um my personal interest or my personal passion um, but it starts on land way before, you know, way before the ocean. Mm. And the ocean connects us globally. I think that's also a very important factor, right? And I, I am assuming it's not the main focus of no limber, but do you have any information how much waste does Indonesia receive from the global north to process, let's say? Yeah, it is. It is. It is a huge thing. Um, I don't have, like you said, the exact the exact numbers. Um, however, we are in the West, not us as individuals, but in the West, we are very much part of the problem simply because it is actually cheaper for the countries and the authorities to export the waste rather than recycling it themselves. Um, so there is, you know, this thing of, oh, they will just recycle it, recycle it fine. When in fact, what happens is that it just goes into those landfills uh, most of the time not properly managed uh, or dump sites or it just ends up in the environment again you see a lot of these items made in whatever country um, that just you know um, beach on the shore um, so yeah it is it is a huge problem and it's something that a lot of people close their eyes on and this is actually um, a question that I get a lot why am I here doing this here in Indonesia rather than in Europe, where we do have some problems, well, a lot of the things that happen here are actually deeply connected and intertwined with Europe and the West sending their trash over here. So, yeah, we also we are impacted by the problem and we are also somehow a cause of the problem. So we need to do something collectively about it. What is the answer that you give to the people when they ask you about Indonesia and why you focus there? Well, exactly this. Uh, I do consider myself part of the problem or I have been part of the problem for long years um, and I do think that it's not a individual country's problem it's a global problem both in the impact and in the cause um, so it should be a collective concern and a collective solution that we bring to the problem and I think somehow we don't mind all being part of the cause but when it comes to finding a solution everyone should find a solution for their own country or area or whatever and yeah i refuse to say it that way so mm. if we connect this interconnectivity with the education what we talked about earlier what are maybe two or three facts about waste management that each and every listener should be aware of so one of it i don't want to Okay, I'll put it slightly differently because uh, someone mentioned something to me that was very inspiring. So I'll put it slightly differently to not just take exactly what it told me. But waste is basically a commodity and has value more than it is trash. I think the word trash is not quite adapted to waste um, until it is actually discarded and gets damaged and cannot be recycled anymore. It does have value and it's something that is quite alien to a lot of people in the West. Because for us, we just put it in the bin, it goes away. We don't really wonder what's happening there. But there's actually a huge market behind this. There's a lot of money flowing, um, just not for us, you know. Um, but yeah, it is basically value until we actually don't manage it properly. So that's that's the thing that people should switch their mindset to, I think. Um, this is one thing. Another thing is... The best, the best waste management or the best way to handle waste is to not generate it as much as we can. And by this, I don't want to make people feel bad about generating waste in general, because we all do. Um, but the more we can limit this to what is strictly necessary um, or what we really need or what we really, really, really want, because they can be this as well. Um, we don't want to you know, make people feel bad or anything, but the more you limit it, the better it is. 
that's the second one. And a third one, what could it be? Um, well, I guess a third one would be little steps. Don't underestimate little steps. Um, you know, it's it's something that when you when you are an entrepreneur in general, not only in waste management, you do see a lot of people getting excited about an idea or getting excited about what you do. And then when it comes to concrete actions, people are going to be like, oh, yeah, but, you know, I, I can't do much. So I'm just not going to do anything at all. This is a mistake. <laughs> any little help, any little step that you're taking. So help for businesses or step that you're taking in your own personal life to change the problem is very big actually it's just that you don't see the the bigger impact but if everyone was doing this it would actually have a big impact so don't underestimate the snowball effect of everything and the snowball effect of your little actions on this huge problem no i definitely do agree and small funny side story that comes to mind when i was working after high school in an ngo in india we worked in social enterprise development and we created 13 different enterprises and one of which was the production of cotton bags. And back then, cotton bags were not in every supermarket and cotton bags were not available each and everywhere. And the name of the company was Small Steps. So I was just reminded of that. And I think it is small steps that we all must take. And if we combine all those small steps, we actually reach the big leaps and Charlotte maybe use let's use that as a little segue and talk about no limba and my first question would be what does no limba even mean yeah, that's a great question uh, no limba means either zero waste or no no waste um, so you can read it the way you want that's also why I wanted this one rather than um, other words that mean the same thing in, uh, in Bahasa uh, Indonesia, because it is very simple for any foreigners to pronounce it. There's no hard letter. There's no R that can be pronounced in different ways. You know, the, all the sounds are very easy to say for any any language. Uh, it does sound somehow very familiar to everyone. No limba. People just remember it very spontaneously. And it just means yeah, zero waste or no waste combined together. So limba means waste and nol and ol means zero or no is no so pretty pretty easy mm, wonderful okay and you talked a little bit to that but what motivated you to create and found no limba <clears throat> yeah i went a bit into just the indonesian side like when i went to the country um but in fact there was a first step when i started to think what can i do to help the country the first thing that comes to mind to a lot of people me included was help charities go and do some beach cleanups, uh, go out there, talk to people, see what's going on. And so I started doing some beach cleanups. And as I was doing it, <laughs> I realized that it was helping raising awareness. I was getting information through that, so I'm not going to undermine this. Um, but the problem itself was not sorted whatsoever. Um, and it becomes more and more obvious today. But a few years ago, I think people were still quite convinced some people are still quite convinced that you know beach cleanups are still uh, maybe doing a little something to the root of the problem when in fact an hour later the same amount of waste is just gonna be on the shore um, and I started becoming aware of this and I was like well as much as I love the ocean and I want to be by the beach I think the problem roots a bit before on land somewhere before it actually gets into the ocean um, and so that's when I started trying to understand the system itself and realizing that you know maybe a systemic change would have more impact than bringing people together to kind of uh, uh, wipe the the water off the floor you know I usually compare uh, this waste leakage to an actual leak um, in your house like with your sink leaking and yeah you can just remove the water as much as you want but if you don't fix the actual leak somewhere it's going to keep flowing out and it's exactly the same thing with the waste. So that's when I started understanding this. And I started getting in touch with different stakeholders, with different collectors, with different recycling companies, understand how they interconnected and understand, in my opinion, at least one part that was missing. And that's why we tried to create 
Okay. So what is the mission and the vision of No Limber then? So what is it that the business operations really do focus on? Yeah. So the mission of No Limber is to stop this waste leakage at the source by making waste collection convenient, accessible, uh, both financially and um, logistically to everyone in Indonesia, including more modest income households, right? Because I'm going to get into this, but the system makes it somehow ex more accessible to people that have money than people that don't have money when it should actually be a basic need. So this is what we are working on. And in terms of our vision, I mentioned that before, we try to create a very local solution that's replicable. So the idea is not only to have it work everywhere in Indonesia as long as people have an internet connection, which is more and more everywhere except the most, most remote areas, um, but that can also apply to any country that has this informal collection system, which is pretty much anywhere in Southeast Asia. In India, you mentioned it's like a huge um, similar problem in a lot of African countries, a lot of South American countries. So anywhere that has this system that we're going to get into, I'm sure, about um, the system of informal collectors kind of embracing the value attached to the waste, um, we can apply our technology. Mm, okay, thank you very much. And what would you argue towards someone who says, okay, waste collection is certainly a step before waste collection at the beach, but the root cause may rather be the production, which you mentioned, or the import or policies around waste creation, let's just call it. Well, I agree. <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with the fact that it's a combination of factors, which includes this one, but includes many others. And when people tell me, we're going back to the little steps when people tell me, oh, but you know, this is not going to sort the entire problem. I agree hundred percent. I will never say, and I never communicate on saying that we're going to sort the entire problem. What I'm saying is that we need to start somewhere and we need to take baby steps that are as close as possible to the root of the problem. Nolimba is one of them. Nolimba has potential to also address big roots of the problem, like education, because a mobile app is accessible to everyone. Content in a mobile app, if you make it engaging to everyone, you can put a lot of education in there. You can put a lot of advertising for products that matter, like just giving you an example. I met recently a person who's doing a fantastic job at making... Um, filter for water for tap water here in indonesia that's almost not drinkable accessible to everyone he, he found a way to make it very very cheap if you advertise this on an, on an application and you actually make it clear for people how they can save money by getting and, and save their health <laughs> in the process by getting um these filters rather than keep buying plastic bottles this can be a huge huge problem that you slowly eliminate so that brings that can bring education in the long run that can bring better management after the collection because now we focus on actually connecting the households to the collectors. But what we want ultimately is to connect better the collectors to the recycling facilities, right? This is also something that technology can do. So you got to start somewhere and expecting to go from 0% to 100% is back to the problem that we said initially of people saying, well, I'm not going to do anything then because I'm not going to sort it out entirely. So yeah, I, I definitely answer that I agree with them, but you got to start somewhere and baby steps. Mm, yeah, zero to 100 usually is a little bit overwhelming and the small steps, I definitely do agree. And I suppose that you connect with people who write policy or who campaign for less production of waste or who interact with people who import and export waste and really also to find your sweet spot where you're passionate about where you can see your impact and then start acting because from action actually creates or action creates truth action creates results right and not so much only thinking about it so thank you very much about that and you talked in the very beginning about that 61 percent of waste is not being collected in indonesia and maybe we can discuss a little bit how the waste management in Indonesia looks like or in Bali looks like and then why you're using you mentioned technology and you mentioned an app and something that I came across when doing some research for the 
podcast episode, I was wondering what is a pemulung? A pemulung. So I think we need to explain the, the system overall so that the pemulung comes into the picture. So basically the, the waste management system or the waste collection system here in Indonesia is quite different from what we know in the West, um, let's say. So usually what we do is that we pay taxes, we put our trash in the bin, we separate in the best case scenario, it disappears one or two days of the week and we don't hear about it anymore, right? Um, here it's quite different. So people do pay taxes, but they're not put um, in the same type of services, let's say. So they don't really use it for households um, waste collection. Instead, you have private companies that people pay per month, per week, whatever they decide on, um, to have a service coming to their house and, and picking up the waste. Back to what I mentioned earlier, this system makes it more accessible for people that have money, right? Um, a lot of people cannot afford it or a lot of people do not want to pay for it, um, which can be understandable. You know, it's, it should be a basic need and having to pay for this could would probably make crazy a lot of people even back home. Um, the idea of paying for your waste is just not something that a lot of people want to um, to hear, hear about. Um, so yeah, you have this system private companies, you have another system, which is basically no system, discarding your waste, burning it in your garden, going to the nearby river and putting your waste, that's that's quite common. Or you have the informal collection, and you mentioned the Pemulung. The Pemulung are the informal collectors. Um, their system is actually quite well put together, so it's just a name that they're being given, informal waste collectors, but in fact, they, they actually have a pretty pretty good system into place. Um, but basically, these people are, you know, on their little scooters, they have two baskets on the side of the scooters filled with waste, uh, recyclable waste, most likely, and they just drive around during the day um, in search of whatever waste they can find that would be valuable. So they can pick up from the side of the road, they can go and pick up straight from the river, from the beach, wherever, or they will go to people and in the best case scenario, pay for their recyclable waste. So they just see a bean bag in their garden and they just go and be like, hey, do you want 10,000 10, rupiah, which is like a bit less than a dollar or something um, for this, I'll just pay you, grab it and go home. And that's what they do for a living. And then they resell it to recycling facilities with a bit of a margin. And over time, obviously they make a bit of profit from that. Hmm. So is it basically that no limber connects households with Pemolungs and creates a technological platform for them to exchange waste as it has value? Exactly, exactly. So this is this is what Nolimba is, and this is not inventing a system that is not already in place, um, because a lot of people do think there's going to be a big barrier to entry to explain this value, but here people understand very clearly that, you know, if they separate and if they sell their plastic, there's some value attached to it. So this system is already existent, but it's not optimized. So when you ask people, how do you interact with the Pemulung? Do you have their number? Do you, how do you call them when you need? Oh, we don't know. They just, they just come by. They come by sometimes. And, you know, if, if they show up, that's cool. If they don't, I will just burn it in my garden. So that, there's so little missing to actually have a system that's way more optimized and, uh, you know, that just put the pieces together with very simple technology. We're not talking about, you know, I see a lot of, or I hear a lot of things of people going to countries that maybe are not too familiar with AI, blockchain and, and things like that, and just try to come and kind of put their, what they're familiar with in a country that's not familiar with it. This is not the approach that we had. We're trying to come here and see what's existing and try to put something very simple, very, very simple, the simplest possible to connect the dots that are already into place. Hmm. How tech savvy are your users slash the households in Indonesia, Indonesia? So it goes from very little tech savviness to very tech savvy. Um, but obviously we built our solution based on the very little tech savvy people. Um, because if they can use it, then anyone tech savvy will be able to use it. Um, so our application is definitely the simplest you could ever see. You know, um, it just has 
a home page where you can press one button. There's not many options to put any to tap on anything else. One button to book a collection. You just follow the process step by step. There's no options to go back or whatever. It's extremely, extremely simple uh, so that people that are not so tech savvy can actually understand. And we built it based on their feedback. So that's something that we are very, very um, um, particular about. about. We go to villages and we do ask people, what do you not understand? What is not clear here? This button is not clear? Okay, what could make it clearer? What would make it more standing out to you? And then we just refine everything step by step, following their feedback to make it more aligned with what they understand. Mm. How many other, well, waste management companies, I suppose, use this tech approach or how many of the Pemulungs have organized themselves with, I don't know if it's WhatsApp or if it's Telegram groups or if it's any of that. Do you have any insights about that? Uh, so clear insights, no. It's more like, you know, talking to people. Uh, I know there are at least um, three that I have in mind apps that are taking similar directions to what we do, different in a way, but also working with Pemulung and uh, waste management using an app. Um, and then you mentioned some things that are less of a nap, but yeah, WhatsApp, um, Facebook, Marketplace, these sort of things. The Pemulung actually use it quite a bit. Uh, still quite disorganized, but they are tech savvy in that respect that they actually understand pretty clearly how to get something fast and you know how to follow the, the trend of the prices pretty fast on this marketplace. Um, so they are actually quite tech savvy in that respect, but still not optimized, I would, I would say. How do individuals and supposedly also companies reach out or engage with No Limber? Is it referrals? Is it that you do marketing? Is it that you speak to the head of the village or of the community, what you mentioned earlier? How do you engage with potential new households, I just want to call it? Yeah, um, so that's a great question because we're just changing to something slightly new. So until very, very recently, still even now, um, but until very recently, we were doing solely beta testing. So solely with the villages, like I mentioned, with non-tech savvy people to try and refine the solution. So the way we would approach um, people was in partnership with a couple of universities uh, that actually had some programs, what they call programs here, which is um, basically social work, um, social community, work um, in partnership with some villages and the university and they bring some students to you know um, do this community work so we kind of merged in these programs um, because they already had a program for organic waste and they were missing something to take care of the inorganic waste so we went along um, and basically approached the local authorities mentioned to them what we were planning to do how we were planning to do it um, and from them, they gather a group. So they ask us what we need. Okay, well, let's say we need 50 households to be a part of this program. Okay, cool. We'll gather 50 households. You can do sort of a demo to explain um, to people how your product works, how it's going to happen. And then we're going to do a first round of testing for the next month or so. And then we can see the results. And then we can maybe approach other people and keep doing it that way. So this is the approach that we've had for the past year and something. Just keep doing some testing, <clears throat> pardon me, with um, with local authorities and with the villages. And just now, because we finally reached a point where our app is well-refined, refined enough to have more people on board, where we do more marketing for like city people. So we just opened the download to more people. We opened a wait list. Um, and we're just <clears throat> asking people to download more and more. And when we will get enough people in a certain area, then we can unlock the app for these people, train a collector and start doing some testing with these people in a specific area. Mm, wonderful. Well, that's great to hear. And another component that you talked about briefly, I mean, it actually was the first and most important component about waste management and that it has value. And you were talking about prices. And for me to understand it would be interesting. Is a kilo of plastic worth the same today as it is in three weeks or in three months? Or how much fluctuation do you have? A lot, <laughs> a lot and very quickly. Um, that's why I use the term commodity, because it is dependent on 
the oil and gas gas prices. It is dependent on the supply and demand of the industrials, um, on also um, how the land fields are filled or not, over capacity. On like, there's a lot of factors that actually make the um, the prices vary, and it goes fast. So this is definitely something that you know um, in the future will be more able uh, to not control, but to regulate or have more um, view into how it fluctuates as soon as we can partner with recycling centers and we know how much they buy from the Pemulung for this month or the following month, then we can have a better understanding of how much the Pemulung will buy from the households. Gets a bit, uh, we're getting into the uh, the complicated stuff, but, um, um, but yeah, as soon as we have this B2B side of our activity where we can partner with recycling centers, we will have more power over this or more view, how do you say? More insight, that's the word I was looking for. More insight on um, how exactly it fluctuates. But for now, we are very much, you know, trying to understand via the Pemolung, how much are you buying this month? Okay. And we kind of list the prices and then the next month, okay, we have an understanding of where the prices uh, went. Um, but yeah, it fluctuates a lot. It is definitely very fast and very um, uncertain. No, and I'm very happy to hear that the consumers certainly do have reason to work together with you. And what you explain is also that local authorities are keen on improving their waste management, let's just call it. And I don't know if you want to talk to it, but what are the incentives that a Pimolung has from working with you? That's maybe one question. And the other one would be, how are similar initiatives I just want to call it in Bali or in Indonesia, interacting amongst each other. Are you guys supporting yourself? Are you guys helping each other out? Are you sharing technology? Are you sharing approaches? Yeah, maybe that's the second question, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I remember the first the first one was um, the incentives. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, optimization they actually do see very quickly how they're saving time in their activity because obviously for now we don't have as many users as we hope in the future but once you start having enough users okay i get an order just have to go come back done don't have to think about it for now they really are driving around in hope of finding enough to have enough revenue for the day that's basically what it is there's no guarantee at the end of the day that you know, they will have enough um, income. So what it brings to them is the certainty once we get we get enough users that they will be able to have not only enough income, but probably increased income because more opt optimized compared to what they have now. So the incentive is actually quite clear to them pretty quickly. They're usually, believe it or not, more keen to adopt Nolimba faster than the households, even though households get the money immediately. So you would think that they get it, uh, they adopt it faster, but usually it's the collectors actually seeing the understanding <clears throat> pretty quickly how uh, valuable it's going to be for them. It's offensive, but I'm uh, very trusting that it will grow and uh, get somewhere. Mm, no, absolutely. And that sounds very promising. And maybe that can lead us to a question. If somebody from this audience, or if somebody is inspired by the business model of No Limber, how much open source is it or how accessible is all the information that you have gathered over the past years really and if somebody would like to set something similar up either on the other end of the island in bali or in africa or somewhere in asia how accessible is the technology and how accessible is the business model maybe of no limber but also of waste management in general where would you refer people towards to um well, I would say the thing is with Nolimba, it's extremely accessible. Like we made the app open to everywhere on purpose. Like you can download it from everywhere. The one thing that I would say is trickier, let's put it that way, is the legwork that you have to do to onboard people. It's the whole principle of a marketplace, right? You need to have, the, the, you have this chicken and egg problem when you need to have enough households and then enough collectors and make everyone happy, right? So that takes a lot of legwork on site. Um, that being said, if someone came to me and told me, hey, I want to be an ambassador of Nolimba 
in this country because or in this at least city in this country uh, because I know a lot of people that would download it and be straight away on board that's definitely something that we could discuss you know like if, if some people are motivated to do the legwork on site that we can solely do where we are implemented um, and to help on this and on board people on both sides do some training and spend a lot of time on this that would be fantastic I would never say no to that like the the more places the better <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much for opening that space. And maybe that leads me to a question. What would be your ultimate dream for waste management in Indonesia? Well, that would be yeah, more connection and more collaboration between um, all the stakeholders. I did, I think, mention very quickly earlier how there's potential, and I'm saying for Nolimba, but it's in general um, for stakeholders to collaborate. There's definitely, let's take a simple example, otherwise I'm going to get into complicated explanations. Plastic bags, all right? Plastic bags, very hard to recycle, very thin plastic, very tough to recycle, very low value. For now, collectors don't collect it. They don't have an interest. They cannot resell it to anyone, right? That's one of the questions that we get the most. Actually, a lot of households tell us, like, what are we doing with the plastic bags? Well, for now, we don't have a solution. We are already in touch with a couple of um, um, organizations that focus solely on residual waste. So like plastic bags, sachet, all these plastics that are actually very hard to recycle. Um, one of these companies is actually making some fuel out of it. So like putting it back into its original state. Um, so fuel out of it. And another one that I know is um, creating arts out of it, right? They do like either bricks or actual mosaic, like plastic and stuff. If these organizations are happy to be connected to Pemulung and are happy to buy the plastic bags from them, then that gives an incentive to the Pemulung to go and buy the plastic bags from the households. So there's so much potential to connect things better so that you just streamline the entire process by collaborating with different stakeholders. So that's kind of uh, yeah, my dream for Indonesia. It's just like better collaboration and better. I don't think people don't want to collaborate. I think it's just it's just not streamlined in many ways. And it just takes some things to connect the dots together. Mm, no, thank you very much for sharing that. And since the creation or the foundation of No Limber in January 2020, how much progress do you see? And maybe the concrete question is, what are setbacks that you faced over the past years? And what are major achievements that you are very proud about? Yeah, so there's been there's been a lot happening. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with the proud because it's always good to start with the positive. Uh, I'm proud that we set Nolimba up during COVID with a team that was and still is in some capacity scattered um, in the world. I was not in Indonesia when it started. Uh, my co-founder still is not in Indonesia. He's still based in Spain. Um, and we had a teammate based in Bali still had to be one at least, <laughs> um, a local teammate. So that's how we started. So we literally started everything, even doing the research, being completely scattered and doing our entire strategy based on the information that we would get from on site, but also purely from passion and understanding um, deeply what was going on. So that's that's one thing, going into actually work and actually being an app that some people are already using, starting in a pandemic context. <laughs> so I'm pretty proud of this. Um, some great achievements and like progress that we've been making. Again, we started from zero to have an app that is actually functioning, that is doing some beta testing. I think the proudest moment I've had was when we did our first collection. The very first that the app looked nowhere near what it looks like now. Uh, it was a very, very alpha version that had one button, a lot of bugs. You know, but it worked. We saw that the collector understood quickly, could use the app, make it to the house, make the transaction, and we're just here in awe, <laughs> thinking like, wow, we made it. it. It is possible, you know. Um, so that was probably one of the proudest moments. And then seeing it growing to a couple of villages, um, having more and more people using it. Now we're a bit above two tons of recyclable trash collected, only doing beta testings with very little amount of people 
So I always tell people now, imagine if it was hundreds or thousands of people using it, how much quantity we could get, you know? Um, and we're talking again about ways that is being sold to recycling centers because again, the collectors, the only incentive they have in paying people is to resell it and make sure they can resell it to recycling centers. So most, if not all the, the, the waste that was collected through Nolimba made it somehow to be properly managed. So yeah, every time I think of the potential of you know having more users um, using the app would be it would be huge in my opinion. So that's definitely some progress that we've been making. A lot of awareness that we've spread um, with some side activities. I mentioned earlier how beach cleanups um, are what made me create Nolimba initially, but we went back to beach cleanups because that's a thing that is actually very useful to uh, introduce people to what we do and to the root of the problem and to gathering people from the community. So we did a lot of these um, sort of events, so a lot of spreading awareness, um, going to schools, trying to educate um, people in schools. So all these um, side activities that are actually very core um, solution to you know, educating people. We did a lot of these and um, this is huge progress in my opinion. Um, yeah, and the setbacks, there's been quite a few. Um, there's been quite a few also because the culture is very different. I'm in a country that's not mine. I'm learning the language, but I'm not there quite yet. Um, although my understanding's got good, it's, uh, you know, I always tell people it, it is hard, even when you start knowing a language, to start practicing it at work because I'm meant to have credibility. I cannot speak like a five-year-old to a head of a village in Bali. That that wouldn't work <laughs> at all. Um, so yeah, I'm getting there, but obviously it takes a bit of time. So it takes to have my teammates translating for me. Um, it takes an understanding of, yeah, the people and the culture. That's very different from what I know. Simple example, I mentioned that our app is made based on the feedback that people give us as it happens uh, the indonesian culture is not very much into being upfront when it when it is to say things that could offend you right they don't want to be mean to you which is lovely on paper um, however when you try to build something you want very upfront feedback you want people telling you this is terrible this is not working you should improve this you should improve that um, this is feedback that is actually very hard to get here. Um, so you have to really spend a lot of time with people um, to really understand with the facial expression, get them to use and see where they can't with your own eyes. Like, okay, I see that you are um, not understanding these steps. Let me understand why and kind of walk people through ending up telling you, okay, maybe I don't understand this. So all these things are, um, you know, it's, it's beautiful in many, many ways. Um, but it takes time, I would say it this way. It's not necessarily setbacks, but it things might take more time than it would um, in France, for instance, in my country. Mm. Quick follow-up question on that. Would you use anonymized feedback or how would you receive feedback from your users? Let's just call them. No, so we. Uh, this is not really something that we can do because technology, like I said, it would do something that is very simple for not tech savvy people. So we did try a couple of times to do... Um, um google forums to survey people and stuff it worked to a point but most of the time people would ask us to actually do paper uh, surveys and things like that and sometimes we would not get them back yeah so it goes down to going to places um and really you know ideally walk them through the app but not helping them just being like hey i'm just going to be here let's have a let's have a coffee together um let's have a good time and at the same time you know try the app and I'll just I'll just take a look quickly and see <laughs> what's not working here um, or you know simply spend quality time with people so that they feel comfortable with you and really comfortable sharing some deeper thoughts with you so th that's what I mean by a lot of like work it's uh, it might change from one country to another but there's there's a lot of getting trust from people as a foreigner as well probably even more so than a local person I need to really gain trust that I'm here for a good reason um, so yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of time, but it's it's also the beauty of it. Uh, I have to say, I've been uh, enjoying it a lot. 
No, it sounds like, and I mean, that might also change a little bit once you grow further and then maybe the head of the village becomes the trustworthy person where people actually share also more constructive or more negative feedback and then it's being played back towards you. So all the best with that. And Charlotte, we mentioned a few things that are similar or applicable of waste management on a global scale but we also discussed that indonesia has a fairly individual or precise challenge and how you deal with it and you talked about the dreams that you have for waste management in indonesia if i would ask you the same question on a global scale so what is it that your hopes and dreams are for waste management on a global scale what is it that comes to mind um, well, something quite similar, actually, because I think the reason why I have this dream for Indonesia is because it is easily applicable, not everywhere, but to countries that have a similar system, right? So any countries that has this informal collection system. Um, so I really like this idea that we go back down to more local solutions. I think that's kind of the root of sustainability as well. It's like, don't solely rely on, you know, big systems or, um, kind of broad solutions that are a bit disconnected from people but let's go down to something that's at the scale of the village at the scale of your neighborhood um of people you know you can put a face on and and that will most likely in my opinion change people's behaviors more efficiently um as well just because people can put faces on um on their local collector um, there's some bonds created that created there you know we actually created some friendships between some collectors and some households now they only want these collectors to come to come by and have a discussion with them so I think it, it tends to change people's behaviors more when they have fun and when it's just something more relatable more relatable to people so yeah that's that's also the dream I have for all the countries that have similar systems. it's just let's bring it back to something more local let's bring education that's accessible to everyone and also an education that's not punitive not something that just you know gives this moral to people like stop throwing bottles because it's bad it's like short but how do a lot of people care that you know that have um, that struggle sometimes to even um, have food at the end of the day like they won't care about these sort of things so if you actually educate in a way that is more bringing value to people and you explain to them well Actually, you know, you could save that much money if you just bought one of those filters I mentioned earlier, instead of all these plastic bottles. Let's say on average, you pay that much per year. That's that much money you could save in one year. So imagine how much you could save over, over a couple of years or something. Like all these sort of things are very easily, um, very easily bringable, <laughs> say, or like accessible through technology. And yeah, just make it more local. That's uh, my take on it. Thank you very much for that. And Charlotte, I have a couple of questions that I ask each and every podcast guest. But before we go there, if people want to reach out and get to know more about waste management in Indonesia globally or about No Limber, where and how can they do so? Well, they can go on our website on uh, www.nolimba.com. Um, I'm pretty sure there's my email address on it. Um, and I'm um, pretty accessible always happy to you know discuss with people that actually have an interest in not only what we do but understanding better waste management so always happy to exchange with anyone um, that would want to have more information um, otherwise there's also our instagram you know we try our best not only to just put pretty pictures and uh, um, but also to give information to people actually especially targeted towards um, the indonesian market but like I said, it's fairly similar to a lot of countries. So we do explain, you know, um, about the value of the waste, about um, how much people are paying here, why it can be a problem, try to give this sort of information so that can always be valuable. So at nolimba underscore. And yeah, just reach out. Always happy to exchange with everyone. And I will, of course, make sure to link all that to the podcast description. And Charlotte, is there anything that comes to mind that you deem we haven't discussed in depth today or that you would like to shine light on before we go for the last final three questions? Um, well, I think we went in depth into it, but I would like to give 
even more highlight to these collectors because now that's probably something I didn't mention um, how they quite often have a bad reputation or you know a lot of people there are some bad apples everywhere but a lot of people would be like oh you know they just come through my waist and take things and then I don't even know what they want to say about them to be honest because they do they do literally the work that no one wants to do and they give you free money for it so I don't know how they can still have this bad reputation to be honest but sadly um they do have it in a lot of people's eyes um probably because waste management is not the most glorifying um industry for a lot of people but they are doing a fantastic job they are the real trash heroes um waste heroes in many many countries and they are the connection that's missing in many many places and they deserve way more light shed on them so we're trying to do that at a little level but it takes a lot of people to change their perspective on them and to even acknowledge them and see them see what they're doing a lot of people don't even know about their existence they are everywhere uh just you know not catching the attention and not being um um how do you say not being too loud about what they do um so yeah if you know anyone in indonesia or in a country with similar system take the time to maybe stop on the side of the road, observe when you see the hard work that they're doing because they truly deserve it and they're doing a fantastic job. So yeah, another mm -hmm. shout out to them. <laughs> no, thank you very much for shining light on that and for the appreciation of the waste management workers. And I think this is even somewhat true to the global north, right? The profession of being in waste management is not really being looked up to and... What you can do next time you see someone, just say thank you or give a smile and see what happens. I think this is something that is also underestimated because in the end, as you said, they very much do a super important job and one that is helping all of us in Indonesia, but also in France and in any other country. So maybe next time you see someone, be thankful. And yeah, thank you very much for that. And that leads me to the first and final question for today's podcast uh, episode anyways and that is charlotte what is it that makes you hopeful nature <laughs> i think it's nature simple answer but um i actually tend to forget sometimes because i spend a lot of time inland going to recycling facilities and things that are not you know what people picture valley like um and sometimes I forget why I came here in the first place or, you know, you tend to, no matter what job you do, it's, it's difficult to see the bigger picture sometimes. So what I love to do is, for instance, what I did this weekend, escaping for a day, going to an actual gorgeous place, nature as much as possible, sit down and remember why I came here in the first place. And uh, yeah, every time it gives me more hope and uh, motivation to keep going. <laughs> No, and I think nature is really beautiful for that. So thank you very much for sharing that. The second question is, who are your mentors or whom do you look up to? Um, there's quite a lot of people. So I, I don't, I'm not someone who, because I have a lot of uh, friends or people around me that actually do have precise names. That, you know, they they watch a lot of videos of or they read a lot of their books or whatever I'm not so much like this I find more inspiration on people around me uh, probably because I have more of a situational memory so I kind of like sharing a nice moment with yeah definitely people that I look up to so it could be um I have some friends here that I met in networking events actually but they they do have good visions and um not only waste management but they work in sustainability um they have great businesses that I really look up to and especially their lifestyle and how, um, how do you say, how organized they are or like whatever, um, yeah, whatever characteristics um, they have in their work, like how, however they work, that inspires me. I take a bit of this with me somewhere. And I just, you know, try to apply that in my everyday life. Um, but it's not going to be one character. It's going to be, okay, I love the way you organize. I love the way that you see things. I love how you reach out to people constantly 
and you um you're not scared of like having them rejecting you i love the way um that you speak in public i I wish i could do this i love the way that you do this i love and i just like inspire um i get inspired from these people from like little features that they have no i think that's a very important point you raised that it can also be characteristics rather than real character so thank you very much for sharing that and that leads me to the last and final question for today's podcast episode and it's a rather hypothetical one and i call it the three truths so i would like you to imagine that you're traveling all by yourself in space for quite some time for a couple of months or even a couple of years And after all that solo travel, you encounter a human-like species. And they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What is it that you tell them? Oh, that's a a tough one. Mm. Okay, so... One of them would be <laughs> we or like human beings think they know a lot, but they still have a lot, lot to learn. Um, get to know as many human beings as possible because the loudest minority is not necessarily representative of um the entirety of humanity, let's put it that way. Um, And what else could be another one? Mm, They might, maybe they created some, they created systems and societies that, how do you say, went a bit out of their own hands. Um, They started something beautiful that maybe it, got a bit out of their own hands and uh yeah we could do with a lot of uh um like wise knowledge <laughs> and wise advice i think on how to re-steer them thank you very much learning variety and the change of systems with that charlotte thank you so much for being a guest on the just another mindset podcast and if you have any final message or words for our audience today it's all yours Thank you so much for having me first. It was an absolute pleasure. And I hope um, I gave a bit of um, insight to some people, whatever that might be. Um, one last message. No, I think I, I gave it all on the collectors, really. Uh, one last, you know, light on them. But um, I think they are the most important in what we do. And I hope people took that away with them. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. You too. If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.